All right. So. Like I said, I like to ask simple questions because that's what, in the end, we actually need the answers to. All right. So we're going to talk about the timeline of a ventilator because our goal is not necessarily to keep someone on a ventilator long term. We want them to come off of that ventilator. All right. So. We've got just a nice timeline here. So let's, let's start with why do we need one in the first place? Okay, we can't breathe. Now, now why can't they breathe? Okay, so it could be a structure issue, right? They had, um, they had cancer. And we did a whole lot of surgery, and now we have a whole lot of swelling or something going on in that neck. It can be a structure issue. We could have somebody who um, has been shot, and so they've got some damage to that area. Okay. What else can it be? Airbag from cell phone. Okay. So it can be a function issue. Oh, man, I can't spell today. No one should let me have coffee in then. Okay, it should be a fun it can be a function issue where the op the gas exchange is not happening for some reason. Whether it's they don't have the ability, they're a spinal cord injury and they can't um, move their lungs because they don't have they've had too high of a level of injury and they can't control the diaphragm. It could be that they have pneumonia and that is taking over their lungs and so they they can't get that appropriate oxygen level back and forth. Okay. So depending on what the original issue is, we have to fix that before we can let them be off the ventilator, okay? We're not gonna just, uh, we had somebody that they were get, talking about extubating yesterday, but he had a whole lot of swelling in his neck. And I'm like, hmm, I'm not sure I wanna take that out. We've got a nice secure way. I'm not sure that's my best bet right now, right? Um, and so that's one of those things that we want to make sure is that we're fixing the original issue that put us here in the first place. Okay. Sometimes we will just, we over sedated them in surgery and they're just not waking up that fast. Right. So they just are too sedated to get that, the breaths and to control and keep their airway clear and all that kind of stuff. So those are the kind of the things it's really one of those two. Right. And you just want to think about why. What if they have like just an inability to protect the airway? Your physician, and you get guys that were super inebriated and they start cussing. Oh, yeah, you can't protect your airway, so we'd RSI them too. So, we're going with the ethical issues that are going on. We're not going, we've had, I've had a few there too, like, oh, yeah, I mean, yep, doctors do what doctors do. Okay, um, so yeah, we'll get people that are, I mean, we'll get, I'll get, I work I'm from Lincoln, it's a, it's a binge drinking college town, right? So about every fall, we get two to three too drunk to breathe. Literally, they're usually 18-year-olds that have been first time away from home. They went to a frat party. They've never had alcohol in their life. And they did check, like, sh the shots checkers or something. And did, you know, checkers last, the game lasts like five, ten minutes. And they've done like seven, eight shots, right? Plus the cake stands, plus the whatever else they've done. Okay. Um, so we get too drunk to breathe. Again, that's a function issue. Could be a structure issue if that airway starts to collapse. Um, but yeah, usually, like I said, we're going with the ethical scientific reasons here of why we put one in, okay? But sometimes it'll be like, maybe we did surgery and they just haven't are waking up. It could be that we're anticipating surgery and so we're just gonna get that airway in now and then we know we're gonna have to make some decisions here soon. So um, there's there's some different, some different wiggle room. All right, let's talk about this is the fun stuff we like doing. Let's intubate them. We've decided that we need to intubate them. Okay. What do we need to be able to intubate somebody? What do you think? Hmm? A patent inhaler. Well, they may not have one, right? So, so we need to get one in them, right? So we need an ET tube. Um. Okay, you need that stylet that kind of goes down it. Um, the yep. Oh man, it's been bad today. Let's see if I can oh, remotely spell this. We're gonna go with that, right? It's got scope on it. It's got syringe somewhere in there. 
right? Okay. <laughs> Laryngoscopes, those are nice. I don't know if I have one in the bag. I may not. Okay. What's a BVM? Bag valve mask. Okay. So our BVM. Huh? Oh, yeah. So now let's get into drugs because we are nurses are glorified drug pushers, right? Okay. So we got drugs that we're going to have to do. Uh, we're going to want some end tidal CO2. Bag valve mask. Our brand new bag, or this is a brand new one, so this sticks in the bag. Okay, I need something like this because before we get that airway in, we're gonna want to give some drugs. I don't know about you guys, I do not want to be awake when you shove this tube down my throat. I gag on a toothbrush, you're gonna get a whole lot of vomit if you put this down me without me being asleep. Okay, so I heard an RSI kit. What's RSI stand for? Rapid sequence, Rapid sequence intubation. So this is a kit um, that has some drugs in it um, that are kind of our, we grab and go. All right, so that we don't have to go through the Pixis and pull out each ones individually. Um, depending on what you are, like your pharmacist might bring it up, depending where you work, that kind of stuff. So depending what kind of unit you're in, if you're on the med surge floor and you're getting ready to rapidly intubate somebody, um, is respiratory bring it up with them? I'm trying to think what? of the RSI kits. No, it doesn't fix this. Fix this, okay. That's what I thought. Like, So different facilities. Sometimes we have one facility where our pharmacists, when we press, when we called for it, they would bring it up. So just depends on where you are. Um, O2. Oh yeah, we need some oxygen going because we're going to be hooking them up to it. We need a ventilator. Right, let's let's go with back to our basics. We need a vent. Um, you can bag them a while. You can bag them a while. I prefer not to. We're getting them too. I'd rather have a vent to stick them on. Okay. All right. So let's talk about the drugs because drugs are fun. All right. We talked about we want to sedate them. Okay. Um, some different ones. Atomidate is one. Oh, sorry, guys. Versed otherwise known as midazolam. Okay, move that or do I lock it? Let's see if I have more room. Oh, I must have. I will give, so I just had a meeting yesterday and they're gonna, they are saying the generics will always be on NCLEX. So it'll always be generics on NCLEX. Um, I will probably give both because I don't like two names for drugs. So, but I will put both names on the meds. What's the first drug you put? Etomidate, E-T-O-M, itate. It's literally how it, that's why I like that one. I know how to <laughs> spell it. It spells just like it sounds. Etomidate, got it. Okay. Um, another one, sometimes we'll have propofol. Okay. So vers the other name for Versed is midazolam. So should have had a med card that had that one on it. Be a little bit familiar with it. Okay. Propofol. Otherwise known as Dippervan, but I'm pretty sure Propofol is the generic name, which is easy. Okay. All right. So these are your sedatives. Now, are sedatives going to stop the gag reflex? Nope. What is? We need a paralytic. All right. So the one I've seen used a lot for a paralytic is and I cannot say it to save my life, is succinylcholine. I call it sucks. Okay. <laughs> okay. Like, that's what I got. I got, it's like, and I'm going to spell it right, right? Because I wrote it down, so I made sure. Succiny. Oh, my gosh. This is killing me. Right? Okay. See, but that's how I know I do it at the same speed you do. I call it suck. Like, sucks. You'll hear it gives so much of suck. Right? That's usually what the docs will say. Give them, give them whatever milligrams of sex or go ahead. Right? Other ones we have that, um, yeah, like, can you zoom in a little bit for hmm. S U C C I N Y C H O L I N E. I don't know who named it. Whatever. Like, if you'll, it'll hear sucks. You'll hear people say sucks. That's what they say. Okay, no one wants to say that whole, we don't have time for that whole world. Like, we've lost, you know, it's time. 
right? The other one that um, I'm seeing a lot of is Nimbex, and this is the trade name. So I'll give you the, and it's Sissa Tracheum. This is why they don't have me. Uh, there you go. Okay. So Nimbex or Sis, okay. Um, that is going to be more of a long term. We don't usually put um, anybody on sucks. If we do sucks, it's IV push. We don't put people on suck strips. We put them on Nimbex strips. So that's where you hear like they're Nimbex. It means they're paralyzed. Okay, so they'll be like, so that's why you report when you hear like them be like, rattle off all these meds. You start to learn like which meds are the ones that I'm listening for. Like TPN, meh, right? TPA, ooh, that's different, right? Like, so you wanna start listening for those, but, okay. How do you, rem so we give the sedative before the paralytic, why? Okay, because you're wide awake, right? We suck, or we date before we suck, right? <laughs> right, well, you forget it. We said date before we give sucks, right? We date before we suck, okay? Um, I know, like, but no one will forget it now, right? Um, so, right? Said date. Now, pain medications are, have sedative properties, but they're not sedation, okay? So fentanyl is the only one that kind of crosses that bridge a little bit where we use fentanyl for sedation as well as, long, as its um, analgesic effect. But typically, I want you to be on some sort of sedative if we're going to have you on a ventilator, okay? Um, and so that's one of those things that I want you to pay attention to is those drugs get really important. Propofol, Versed, those are going to be drips that we're going to, you can do IV push or a drip depending on. Um, they both drop pressure. So we anticipate blood pressure dropping a lot of times when we start giving these drugs. And we're going to make sure that we're watching that blood pressure pretty close. All right. This is usually a pretty fast event when it happens. One of the things I would tell you is if you are getting ready to, because what's, where's the doc going to stand to put this in, doc or respiratory therapy? I don't know if respiratory, like in our hospital, head respiratory bed. therapy. Yeah, head of the bed. What's at the head of the bed? Headboard. Headboard, right? So take that sucker off. The other thing for you to know is if you do not have a board underneath somebody's back when you're doing CPR, that headboard can be a backboard. So um, just so you know. Um, but a lot of beds now have CPR releases that firms them, so you don't have to worry too much. But uh, we're gonna wanna make sure, if we're prepping, a lot of times I will, so things that we wanna think about is we wanna make the space, make the space available for the doc or whoever's intubating, the anesthesiologist, whoever's coming up to intubate. Uh, we wanna give them that space, so a lot of times we'll move the bed out from the wall, okay, a little bit. That's, but what do we have to make sure we're doing? Because man, there's probably a lot of other things going on in this room, so what do we have to do if we're gonna get the bed moved? Okay, we've got to watch our lines. How do you how do you move one of those beds? What do you got to do to move it? You got to unlock it. Please tell people you're unlocking it. Okay, um, you'd be surprised how many people unlock it and then like all of a sudden somebody's there trying to do like put in a foley while this is all going on. Like there's usually about 20 hands in this situation, right? Um, and so we want to make sure we give space, but we also want to tell people unlocking the bed, move it away from the wall. So that way everybody knows like, okay, I'm getting these lines. Okay, that's why we say things out loud. I know people think a lot of times that the ICU nurses are really authoritarian during these moments. We actually do become pretty authoritarian, but it's not because we are disrespecting anyone else around us. It's because we are just saying, did someone get their blood pressure? Can someone get, make sure to watch their lines. It's not that I think that you can't do that. It's that that's how we all know what's going on in the room. During a code, we always verbalize, you know, epi in now, bagging, start chest compressions. Like it's so we can all hear what's going on. Okay. And it does get very, like most of the time in clinical, I'm pretty chill until we get into a situation like this. And then you will watch me switch into a very like, I need you to do this. You will do, you need to do this. You need to do this. If you feel like that, just step back. You can totally watch. Um, but man, if we have stuff going on in the ICU, they love to pull nursing students into those rooms. 
even to be a fly on the wall, so then we can help you interpret what's happened, okay? So we wanna make sure we're moving the bed, but safety is always the priority for us and the patient. Um, so making sure when we're moving that bed that we're unlocking, if you ever hear a bed unlock, it has a really annoying beep that goes forever. That also lets people know that you've unlocked the bed, okay? I missed a test question once because I didn't say that we would lock the wheels of a bed. And I was like, are you kidding me? And it's because I had been a CNA. So I'm like, I would have already locked the wheels. Like that wasn't even a thought to me. So make sure we're always paying attention to safety. All right. So we're going to get them intubated. Um, then we're going to leave them. I want to move that, but I can't. Um, we're going to be leaving them intubated. How long? Can an ET tube stay in? Nice thing. Remember? Why do we want it out? Why would we want it out? Okay, pressure, skin. Infection, right? You have all this bacteria. Remember? Now it's gross, right? So you have all this bacteria, all this stuff in here, and now has a ladder down to the lungs. Okay, so one of the big things is we want ET tubes out usually about seven to 10 days. Now, since COVID, I'm not sure how much that's changed. Do you know, Brenna, if that's changed at all? Uh, I know for, I don't know, like adults will do two. Okay. I think it's like the max they do. And yeah. Long -term day. So we're gonna do seven to 10 days just cause that last I knew was standard <laughs> practice. If somebody finds something else out, um, we, can, we can always flex up if we have to. Um, I've had patients um, that unfortunately were on it for a month because they were too unstable to switch out. Okay, so we're gonna go. Oh, what? If they have to leave them for extended periods of time, do they put in like a broad spectrum? Oh like yeah, that? yeah. I mean, most of these patients, because if they're that unstable, they're probably on a whole lot of everything. <laughs> yeah, and we can do tube exchanges. Sometimes they're even too unstable for that. Um, it just really depends. Tube exchange is kind of a fun procedure, uh, depending. Sometimes we'll get patients from like a like small rural hospital that only had certain ET tubes, and then we need to switch them out. Our burn patients, we want really big ET tubes in. Why? Why would we want really big ET tubes? What do you think? Okay, airway's swollen. What did they inhale? smoke right so all that all that skin is going to be sloughing off mm -hmm. and we've got to be able to get it out so our burn patients get really big ones um, again a decision that we don't make someone else does we want to switch people out to a trach probably within that seven to ten days um, if we're hitting get close to day seven we're probably starting to say what's our what's our plan you know or if we're on day six, we should probably be starting to make a plan if we're going to switch them out to a trach, if we're going to do long-term ventilation, if we're going to, what we're doing. Remember, these both are in the same spot, right? That cuff, that balloon that's causing it, um, we're both in that, they're in the same spot. One just happens to start here, one starts out here. Okay, so they're both right above that carina area and that kind of stuff. So making sure that we're paying attention to those ET tubes. But if we're hitting that seven to, seven to 10 day, we're starting to think about whether we wanna do a trach, okay? Any questions about that? Has anybody gotten to see a trach put in? I didn't know if you got them down in the ORs and seen them, okay? Sometimes they'll do them down in the OR, sometimes they'll do them in the room. Depends on your facility a little bit. Um, trachs, how long can those stay in? Pretty much forever, right? If we want them in, right? So we can leave a trach in forever. I've, I've known kids that had trachs pretty much since the day they were born and you know they're 20 years old now and they still have a trach, okay? If we're going to be leaving a trach in, we're probably figuring out, like it's probably, we've got either, they've got a trach, they're maintaining that structure. So maybe they're a cancer patient, they've had lots of um, challenges with like oral esophageal cancers or something and we're leaving it in for a structure just to maintain the structure we can put trachs in people for sleep sleep apnea now you'll see people that have trachs in okay um we want to make sure um, we'll have people obviously with trachs in that are going to be 
long-term ventilators. Does Madonna here do long-term vents? I know Madonna and Lincoln does long-term vents. So Ambassador does long-term vents. So, um, and then people can be at home with them. So then we'll switch those guys out to tree. Um, quick thing about a tree. If, oh, I'll lose my pencil, with trachs. We have a thing called a cap that we can put on. What happens if I put this cap on and I have the balloon up? They can't breathe, okay? So this and speak valves, when we start getting people where we're starting to like wean them off of their trachs and we're starting, we need the air to be able to move around the trach. We have to take the balloon down, okay? So that air can get around the trach itself, right? Because they're breathing now through their mouth and they're gonna pull the air around. If I have this cuff up, that's not letting any air down. Um, we had a person at Madonna who they saw um, a speak valve, which is a one-way valve, so they can practice speaking and getting stronger that way. Um, they put the valve, they found it like in the patient's bed. And so they were like, oh, it must have popped off. And they put it on them and then they left the room. It was not a good outcome. Okay, so always, always, if you see a cap that maybe, and maybe they've coughed it off, right? But always pay attention, like this little pilot balloon will tell you a whole lot. So that's the, you can see how nice and flat that is. Okay, and I've got them up here so you guys can kind of play with them too throughout the day. You can see how nice and like bulby this one is. Okay, and that means that balloon's inflated. Okay. So that's something we always want to be paying attention to once we've started switching over to trachs and we're talking about trying to get them extubated or get them off of it. Um, we want to make sure if we're doing caps that we make sure that balloon's down. Okay. So I don't mean to terrify you, but just, and it's better just to like hold on to it and go ask someone for help than it is to just assume. Okay. Because assumptions do not do good things for us. Make sure you assess, oh, is their balloon down? Did they cap, was it on their side table and they just bumped it and it fell into their bed with them? Whatever happened, right? So that poor nurse, I can't imagine like how they're feeling, right? Because no one gets into nursing because they want to hurt people. But we need to make sure we're paying attention. We've got some tricks like this that don't have any cuff, you know? So this one's just gonna be more of a structure. It's, it's helping hold that structure, okay? Um, one of, did you guys go through ventilator? I know we, I had it on there, ventilator alarms and the different causes of them. All right, we'll review those real quick and then we'll kind of move into extubation for our patient. Um, when we have ventilator alarms. One of the ventilator alarms that's, uh, I hear, what, what does it mean to have a cuff leak? Does anybody know? What does it mean to have a cuff leak? Yeah, right? Something's happened, whether it's, now remember about those pressures, ulcers and pressure sores, guess what's happening here, right? So that tissue, like maybe we got them and they were really swollen, they were fluid overloaded, so everything was really swollen in there. Um, now the swelling's gone down. So what's gonna happen to that, that space, right? Like there's gonna start to have cuff leaks. And so you'll hear like this like gurgling sound and it'll be like, it's really funny because you do start to put your hair like, like right next to their throat and you're just like, what? What am I hearing? It doesn't sound like secretions and that kind of stuff. And it's gonna give you what type of pressure alarm. What type of pressure alarm we get with an air leak? Low pressure, why? Yeah, because air is just coming right back out, right? The ventilator's pushing it in. It's just like thinking about blowing bubbles when you're a kid, blowing bubbles in your straw. The air is just coming right back out. Okay, so it's a low pressure alarm. So cuff leaks. Um, so if you come to me in clinical and you're like, my patient's got this like weird gurgly sound and they're low and a lot of times we can fix that pretty quick. We're gonna get respiratory therapists when you've worked with ICUs enough, they'll, a lot of times I'll call the respiratory therapist and they'll just be like, oh, put two to three mLs of air in the cuff and I'll come check on them, right? So that's also when you've built up a lot of trust with your respiratory therapist and they know that you know what you're doing and you're not gonna like slam a whole syringe full of air in there. Cause so they'll, and they'll do cuff pressure checks and stuff so that they know what, how much pressure's in here, right? Because remember, too much pressure is gonna cause that problem. 
and we're gonna help cause problems to that tissue that's inside that we don't always see. All right, so always paying attention, always assessing. Other things we need to pay attention to with E2 tubes is we need to make sure we're charting them. So um, when I say that this E2 tube is 24 at the tooth or 24 at the incisor, what does that mean? Yep, exactly. It's where it's sitting. Okay, that becomes really important because like we've talked about moving them and ro and turning them, right? These shift. The body's not rigid in there. It's sticky, gooey, wet, not yours. Wear gloves. Um, mm -hmm. But everything slips a little bit, right? So you can have, like, maybe you turned them and you got them cleaned up and maybe they were really they have a GI bleed and have a ton and we've spent a while on our side and now you roll them back and all of a sudden that tube is out a little bit. Being able to assess that number gives you something to anchor on it's, instead of being like, I just feel like it's out a little bit more than it used to. That's the, that's the gut telling you, like, I need to look at it. The number is going to tell you, oh, it's, it slipped out. It's now at 22 at the incisor, right? You're not going to be able to necessarily know that. We're going to probably order a chest x-ray and see if it's changed position. Okay, that's usually in your order sets. So you usually have that standing order. Nice thing about trachs or ET tubes, you can see them on x-ray. Most tubes we put in people's body have a radio opaque line. That's why we do x-rays, so we can see those lines and see where they are. All right, but yeah, so kind of always paying attention. Any of your tubes you want to know, where is it at? Because NG is the same way. And I've had patients that, man, those restraints, I don't know why I talk about little bitties. They are the strongest things ever. They get themselves all wiggled down in those restraints and they just like yank. Okay, um, so that can also cause a low pressure alarm when they've pulled the sucker out and are handing it to you. Okay, that's when you're like, oh, I guess we're extubating today. Um, and you hope you get to keep it out, right? Uh, we do have what's called pull and pray where we pull them out. We don't know how they're gonna do. Um, and we, we see, we pull it out just to see how they're gonna do. Okay, so those are things that you might hear people say. So when you measure, like, are you measuring from, like, the mouthpiece that holds it in place, or are you looking underneath? Um, I usually look under, like, I usually either go, like, if it's their front tooth or their lip. Sometimes people will measure at the lip. Sometimes they'll measure at the incisor. So that's why where you measure to needs to also be in there. Like, 24 at the incisor, your previous nurse may have done 26 at the lip. And if you're charting, Yeah. EHR systems where I didn't have lip, like this is our length, this is where, where yeah. the lip did it from. Right. It'll you so you'll just want to make sure that you mark where you where you measured. Okay. Good question. All right. So we don't want people to stay on the ventilator forever, right? We want them to get off. So I don't want to do blue. Let's do this is green as gill, right? We're gonna extubate. What things will tell us that we're ready to extubate. We're ready to get that tube out. Uh, okay, so if they're over breathing the vent or they're breathing on their own. Okay, what other things tell us we're ready to, to extubate? Vital signs, we got nice stable vital signs. We're not, maybe we're not on all the pressors anymore. Okay, certain vent settings, yeah, which which vent setting would I want to, would kind of cue me in the, maybe we're getting close. Huh? FiO2, yeah, like looking at, I mean, also our PEEP, if I have somebody at a PEEP of like 12, 14, 16, I don't know if I'm extubating that, okay? Um, depending, again, depending on disease process, nothing is black and white. That's why we have to understand what all data do I need to gather to make this decision. Right, so if we're going to extubate, uh, we're looking if they're over breathing the vent. That means they have the drive to breathe on their own. They're, how many, how much of their tidal volume are they able to take in on their own? Okay, um, those vital signs, nice and stable. Vent settings, FIO, oops, FIO2. Um, usually, like we're nicely, we want to sit at like thirty percent, right? Maybe twenty-five. To, again, different facilities kind of have their own normal low we're going to go with 30 percent just because i just wrote it 
So that's what we're gonna do. Okay. <laughs> so um, that would tell us that they they're the function of their lungs is working, right? They're able to get that gas exchange process going because they've got they're on 30 percent and they're running 98 percent pulse ox, right? Let's me know. ABG is usually gonna be one. Right? If that ABG is sitting good, that's going to let us know. Back to those ABGs. Oh, boy. It's fair game for the test, friends. Okay? So, remember that respiratory acidosis front fun. Okay? Um, chest x-ray is nice and clear and shows us that we're not having complications. And if we've fixed the original problem. Right? So, we talked about why were they intubated. Well... Maybe, maybe they were intubated because they were a burn, and now we've gotten all the sloughing and all that out, and the burn's really good. Maybe we, it was that they had to have surgery to reconstruct their jaw, and we needed to keep it going until that kind of got stabilized, and now we've got the swelling down. All right, so those are the things that we have to look at. Did we fix the original problem that made us have to intubate them in the first place? All right. Okay, so these are people that are going to extubate and hopefully get better, right? Because they're getting better. Then we have extubate, what we call compassionate extubation. This is where we're extubating knowing that they are going to pass away, right? There's usually a very specific order set for this, um, but compassion and extubation, we're going to give comfort meds. You're going to kind of transition into that comfort priority. Okay, so comfort becomes priority. Um, this is the family that you're going to be working with um, where they've, we've realized like they're not going to get any, they're like had a massive stroke, they're not going to get any neurologic function back or it's going to be very limited. And that's not the life they wanted. So those are where those trach versus ET tube conversations come in, right? So like I've told my kids, they know, no long, no trach, no peg, right? I'm, I'm pretty clear about it. So if I come into any of your hospital beds, no trach, no peg, okay? Unless I can make the decision, nope. Um, and so those are the, the comforts, right? We want to know what family's wishes are. Okay, do they want to be there? Do they not want to be there? Do they, um, this also gets a little complicated when we start getting into like organ donation. So before we extubate anyone, we are going to, pro like that's going to pass away, that we know is going to pass away, we probably need to call our organ donation um, groups. That's not going to be on this test. We'll talk about that when we get into our trauma stuff. But just know that that might be a pause. Like if you're like, why aren't they extubating? It's like, oh, they needed a call live on is ours here in Nebraska. So, um, but, okay. What if we can't extubate them? We'll get to this picture here in a second as a quick review. What, why, what if we can't? What if we can't? What if we can't extubate them? What if we can't? They're not getting better. Ooh, it's getting snowy. Um, what if they're not getting better? What if they're having problems? Can't extubate. Okay, yeah, that's when we have to start doing trachs. Okay, this is when we have to have that trach discussion because we can't leave that ET tube in forever. It's a you know, we have to have start having a trach discussion. One of the things I forgot to talk about too is what they call weaning trials, is another thing that we'll start doing. And they'll put them on like CPAP and see how much they pull and if they have the lung capacity and stuff. So those weaning trials, that will give us another way of helping to realize if they're ready. If they, if they fail, has anyone heard him say they failed their weaning trial or they failed their trial, right? That's what they were doing. They were trying weaning trials. They kind of, they try and slip them off the, <clears throat> slip them down to like a CPAP or slip them into SIMB or something like that. And they'll see if they can breathe on their own and have good pull to get those lungs nice and open. It's gonna make for a fun drive home. So, okay. All right. It'll be, it's Nebraska, it'll be sunny and like, no. be done. And be all melted, okay? 
So that's kind of the timeline of a ventilator, right? We have to get one. We got to get them intubated. We kind of let it ride for a little while. It would be really nice if we could be like, oh, we know they're going to get better in this many days. No one has a crystal ball. Don't give the family a date because they will hold you to it and the patient will prove you wrong, right? So that's one of those things that we're always paying attention to. Do you do a weaning trial of every removal or? We try. I mean, like if they self-extubate, no. <laughs> you know. But like um, a planned one? Yes, so. yeah. And a lot of times what you'll see in the ICU, at least the ones I've worked in, is usually like shift change. We'll do um, a sed what we call a sedation vacation. I didn't talk about that too much. We'll do a sedation vacation means we pull back from the sedation to see if they wake up. Because we want them to be able to follow commands and want them to be able to do stuff. Because the respiratory therapist is going to tell them to do things. They're going to tell them to take a breath. Right? And so they need to be able to follow those commands and do those kinds of things. So we're going to really make sure that we can. Those are the ones I talked about that are the pull and pray, where like they've kind of failed every weaning trial, but we think they'll be able to do it on their own. They're just too anxious. So like our people that have a lot of anxiety, well, that tube with no sedation is going to cause you a lot of anxiety. So even though we know you're getting great oxygen, they might have too much anxiety. And so we may have to just pull it out with ready to intubate again if we have to. And we prefer not to do that. We prefer to know. Is it still a weaning trial if, like, say you're doing those things before they go on a vent? What do you mean? If their O2 is low and they're trying, like, a CPAP machine, but, like, your patient refuses to go on a vent? Weaning is weaning them off. Okay. So yeah, yeah, those would be, that would be like, they're, they keep declining. Yeah. And so like, oh, we kind of hit that tip. And a lot of times, well, it's not black and white, like, ooh, we need to intubate. Some patients, we know we need to intubate. If we're doing CPR, we're probably intubating you, right? That's kind of the two that go together. If you are um, slowly declining, so you've got somebody who's getting sicker and sicker, that's the one beautiful thing about RRTs. Like it, before, it used to be, they have a pulse, I can't call anybody for help. Right? Even though their pulse is really crappy and thready and I know they're declining and all this stuff, like nurses were really struggling. Now that we have um, RRTs, nurses now have people they can call and be like, hey, my patient's declining, I don't know what to do. And you get that extra set of eyes in the room. Patients can call them, families can call them. Like, um, if your patient ever says, I think I'm going to die, that's usually a good time to call an RRT. Um, I mean, make sure that they, tell you why and all that kind of stuff and it's not like oh well the huskers were off so I didn't like that right or my I, my what is that your basketball thing fell apart um you know so we want to make sure it's a legit reason that they're like I just I feel like I can't get a breath I feel like you know let's get some help in there um that actually has saved a lot of patients doing RRTs because before it had, we had to wait until they had no pulse then we could push the code button Right, so that wasn't real effective because <laughs> usually we're too far down the rabbit hole. Now we can kind of catch you as we see you going. So that's been really nice. But yeah, if we can get you off the ventilator, that is our ultimate goal is to get people off the ventilator. Some people stay on three days while we get antibiotics dumped in for pneumonia or whatever, um, and we get them off and they do really great. Some people um, just need more time coming off sedation, that kind of stuff. So we just, we have to work with them, okay? Here is, I just put this up just as a quick review tool. What would you say for this person? What do you think? What, what values do you see that you look at right away? Okay, so PEEP is five. So we've got good tissue compliance, right, in those lungs. Right, yep. See, it said it's VT there. I'm like, I don't know why they do that. So, um, yeah, you got your nice tidal volume's 500, so that's probably a pretty tall person, or they've got good lung compliance. Oxygen is 60%. That's good. Yep. So your FiO2 is 60%, so that's a little on the high side, right? Like, who knows? Maybe they just, you know, they're maybe they're coming down. Again, that's where our trends get important. Like, if they were 80 yesterday and they're 60 today, that's better. If they were 40 yesterday and they're 60 today, Mm, we, we probably want to want to talk about that a little bit more. See what's going on. Okay, our breaths per minute is 20. Okay, and I don't know. This one doesn't really have a mode on it. So, but that's what I want you to look at. Every time you guys have a ventilator patient, even if you your classmate has a vent patient, go in and look at the monitor. You will not hurt it by looking at it. 
okay? But you can learn a lot. You can learn a lot just by looking at what is all hooked to a patient. How many, how many tubes they have? The more tubes they have, definitely the sicker they are. It's a really easy ratio, right? Like less tubes, better, more tubes, bad. Okay, um, unless they're hospice and then we're focusing on different things. Okay, so those are the things I want you to start thinking about as you're working with these patients and walking into those rooms. Go into a room that's not your patient, that's not anyone's, and just look, you know? Just step in there and look. That's one thing I love in the ICU. We have glass windows. You can look through the window if you want, right? Um, but you can observe and learn a lot about where that patient's status is. All right, you ready for some lunch? Yeah. All right. Be back in an hour and we'll we'll see you then.